Time to go amok legally? Two Asian American professors reached that point and are suing the University of Michigan. I talk to them next on A Meal Amok's Takeout. Hi, everyone. Hey, and welcome to what I call A Meal Amok's Takeout. We serve it, you take it out. My takes on all things about race, society, politics, and diversity, and everything those things touch in our culture and society, with respect to Asian Americans. And you don't have to be Asian American to lend us your ears. I'm Emil Guillermo, your host. And you might say, why, why this amok thing, Emil? Well, the short story is this. For nearly 15 years, my Emil Amok column was a staple of Asian Week, what was once the leading Asian American weekly in English in America. Amok was the name of my compilation of essays, and Amok is on my driver's license, but not indicative of my mental state. On this episode, have you ever thought about suing someone? I mean, about a workplace issue or something like that? I mean, generally, people are so litigious in society But Asian Americans most times don't rock the boat. I mean, that's a stereotype. You've heard that. What does it take to go amok? Well, I interviewed two Asian American professors, Scott Kurashigi and Emily Lawson, who are suing the University of Michigan. I talked to them one at a time uh, when much of the news these days is about the confirmation of Neil Gorsuch and whether he will be the country's, well, next Supreme Court justice. He likes to talk a lot about just being a human being, if you have been catching the hearings. But you should read my piece at the Asian American Legal Defense and Education Fund blog at aldef.org, A-A-L-D-E-F dot org slash blog, where I mention two cases where Gorsuch was not exactly the most humane judge. I mean, one case involves Grace Huang, a former board member of ALDEF who suffered from cancer and was forced to sue under the Rehabilitation Act to extend a leave of absence. Uh, Gorsuch said no. Go to the ALDEF blog and see why. Now, there's no doubt getting justice is difficult these days, and most of the time, a lawsuit really isn't the answer. So when it gets to that point, it's serious. Now, for Scott Kurashigi, a full professor with tenure and the director of Asian Pacific American Studies at the University of Michigan, it got to that point in December. He'd been with the university since 2000, was fired in 2013. In December of last year, he filed suit, claiming that it was all his uh, his firing came after he exposed publicly the school's record of discrimination in hiring and admissions. His wife stayed on as a senior lecturer, but then found herself barred from teaching her classes this year. Both claimed the discriminatory treatment they received resulted in a hostile work environment and retaliation, violations of the Michigan Civil Rights Act and the Persons with Disabilities Civil Rights Act. The university recently just responded to the suit and denied all allegations, I talked to both Lawson and Kurashigi individually. Kurashigi started it at the beginning with his hire at the University of Michigan. Well, I started as an assistant professor. You know, it was my first job out of grad school in the year 2000. Uh, I was hired at a time when basically the entire ethnic studies faculty within uh, what was in the program of American culture was in the process of leaving the university for a variety of reasons, but in part because there just weren't serious uh, efforts made to retain faculty of color and to provide support uh, that they needed uh, in the field of ethnic studies. Um, So there were absolutely no uh, full-time faculty at all in Asian Mm -hmm. American studies um, when I interviewed for the job. Um, So, you know... And you were coming from where now? I got my PhD at UCLA. Mm Mm-hmm. And so you studied with that great department there. Uh, yeah, it, was, it wasn't a department even at that time. So I got my depart- a PhD in history, but I got my master's through the Asian American Studies Center. Um, and people like Don Nakanishi, you know, who was really a pioneer 
in the field and had to fight uh, just to uh, have his own scholarly record recognized. He was denied tenure um, originally at UCLA. Um, and, you know, there were so many other um, great mentors that we had. Yuji Chioka was another one of my mentors, a uh, pioneer in Japanese and Asian American studies. So I came from UCLA with a background in Asian American and ethnic studies, but I was also very, very uh, committed to community activism and organizing um, and social justice. And so I had met Grace Lee Boggs, who, as you know, uh, is an elder in the movement, uh, Chinese American who uh, did some of her most significant work in the Black Power Movement and in Detroit's Black community. Uh, and so the idea of going to Michigan was really um, enhanced uh, by the, uh, the notion that I could be closer uh, to Grace Lee Boggs and work more closely with her. So that, that was really what made that uh, an interesting opportunity. Um, so I, I did both things. I was a community organizer in Detroit. I worked very closely with Grace Lee Boggs on her writing and her uh, public speaking. We ended up, as you know, putting a book out together in 2011 um, that sold thousands of copies and, and really shaped organizing debates around the world. Um, a lot of people are referencing Grace Lee Boggs now because of the, you know, the fear and the crisis people feel uh, after the 2016 election. And, and that was... Uh... A, a wonderful book, uh, the, the title of which was? The Next American Revolution, Sustainable Activism for the 21st Century. What, what did your colleagues say about it? So, you know, I did that work uh, because I, I thought it was important for me to be doing it, <laughs> to work with Grace Lee Boggs for my own personal growth, but for, you know, uh, for the purposes of social justice and social transformation, given how, how many... Um, Given the great degree to which Detroit has really, really been assaulted um, as a city and particularly the black community of Detroit. Um, and so I never necessarily expected that uh, I was going to do that work for, for money or fame or credit or anything. Um, the, the really disappointing thing, though, is that, yeah, the university, uh, my department, when they reviewed the book, they literally said it really wasn't worth any work credit at all. Um, they disregarded, you know, what leading scholars have said around the country, uh, and they said in writing, uh, in a formal review, which which uh, I never saw until I basically had to file for a uh, a records request. They said the book was clearly not major scholarship, and it should only be considered as sort of an addendum addendum to my teaching and service, which you know, teaching and service are important uh, things. At the University of Michigan and others research universities, they really don't give you any work credit for doing that, though. So, you know, in terms of uh, uh, giving you um, salary recognition or, or qualifying you for, you know, um, more authority within the department, it's basically saying we, we, we don't count it in any way uh, towards those things. So that, that was very disappointing to see, um, especially when, you know, the department on its own website is praising what a great leader and role model <laughs> Grace Lee Boggs is and how important she is to debates and movements and society. So when that all happened, that must have been a kind of a, a turning point in your mind that something was not quite right here. As you are at this pinnacle as a director of the Asian Pacific Islander American Studies Program at one of the most prestigious schools in America, uh, is, was that like the beginning? Well, no, I mean... I didn't even find that out till later. So what I knew mm -hmm. was, in addition to doing my activist work, you know, because that's what they say a lot of times, right, in, in, in academia is, well, you know, in order to be a serious scholar, you can't just be an activist. You have to do archival research. You have to publish on the top journals. You have to, you know, win major book awards. And I had actually done all those things <laughs> in addition to my active. In fact, my activism had enhanced my ability to, you know, write more effectively uh, as an academic. Um, so I'd gotten a lot of academic recognition, you know, won major awards on campus and on a national level, published in the very top journals in my field, had been invited to be, you know, plenary speakers at the major conferences uh, run by the top professional associations in my field. Uh, and despite all that, uh, my salary was basically at the very bottom for my rank <laughs> continuously. In fact, when I was an assistant associate, a tenured professor, I was being paid less than people just hired out of grad school as beginning assistant professors. Um, 
And so I knew something was wrong with that. <laughs> um, and I knew that uh, as director of API studies, and even before when I was just in the program, that we weren't getting the resources we need. Although we were having all the success, it was all because of extra invisible labor that faculty were asked to do. Not just me, but many other ethnic studies faculty and faculty of color. And the more times we, we pushed that um, with the university, uh, you know, the more resistance we got until the point where they were basically chasing away faculty that they thought were, you know, too demanding or exposing too many inequities within the system. Um, so that's really when the, the, the hammer started to come down. Well, you were, you were doing all these things, but you were also doing these broad studies that kind of exposed the university uh, on discrimination and exclusion and how uh, essentially, their their policy of diversity was a, a kind of sham. Talk about what what you were doing that that might have gotten you in trouble with the university. Well, again, you have to recognize I'm a scholar of race, ethnicity, discrimination, social justice, and again, I've my work there has been peer reviewed. It's been widely accepted, you know, as uh, some of the leading uh, scholarship in the field. So, you know, I'm analyzing society in general at the level of the nation, the level of cities, to look at, at injustice and, and how people confront injustice. And so, you know, not surprisingly, I'm in the middle of a university. I'm doing the same thing. I'm, a, I'm observing, you know, injustices that are happening. I'm analyzing them. I'm using all the tools that I've been trained to develop. But because I have a responsibility to people who are my own students, who are in my department, who are colleagues, particularly people that were in more vulnerable positions than me, I was repeatedly asked, you know, to act and defend, you know, act on behalf of people who were being discriminated against or who faced a hostile climate. Um, and so, you know, I began to catalog these things, but I also filed complaints, you know, and reports with, with my superiors. Um, and that's where, you know, things really got ugly because not only did, um, did they not fix these issues, they at times wouldn't even acknowledge these problems. In fact, I'd, I'd file complaints and I wouldn't even hear back. Well, um, well give, me, give me an example of some of the things you found, like some statistics or some, some findings that, that uh, really expose the university on some of these matters. Uh, not to talk about some of the, the, the personal instances, but maybe some of the broader ones that said, hey, look, here's, this is what's happening here at the University of Michigan. So, you know, we were in a small to, by the time I left, medium-sized department, just one of my departments, right, I'm the Department of American Culture. Um, it was a small to medium-sized unit, and this is a unit that has lost 20 faculty of color from 1997 to 2016. Um, again, most, a lot of departments probably don't even, of that size don't even hire 20 people <laughs> of any race in, in 20 years. We lost, including myself. Uh, and some of them were fired, um, some of them were, were pushed away. Um, people from Michigan have even left academia really out of such frustration with the, the hostile climate at that place. Um, and I think what really gets people, as, as you were alluding to before, is, is the hypocrisy. So in other places, you know, people get denied tenure, they contest it, and, uh, you know, they either win or lose. At Michigan, though, there's always this insistence that no matter what their practice is, their rhetoric never changes. They're so committed. They're the national leaders, you know, in the pursuit of diversity and equity. Um, and so the, the 20 faculty, you know, leaving one small to me, to me was quite eye opening. I reported that to, you know, officials. I said, well, why can't we at least investigate this? Clearly, you know, there's something here. Uh, they never did that. Um, or at least not in a serious way. Um, and uh, I ended up writing about the relationship between the hostile climate on campus um, and discriminatory and exclusionary patterns in enrollment and admissions. Um, and that was uh, published in the Chronicle of Higher Education. It was widely circulated. Um, and I also was interviewed on the uh, Tavis Smiley's uh, national radio broadcast um, to discuss this. And the most interesting thing was, you know, again, obviously people were shocked at some of the numbers. Um, I mean, talking about some schools in which there literally are no people of color coming in um, in many years uh, or just, you know, one or two. How bad were the numbers? So, you know, overall, the thing that people are most aware of is uh, the number of African-American, Latino, 
uh, and Native American undergrads has gone down uh, seriously. So, you know, uh, I forget the exact number, but the college age uh, African American population in Michigan is something like 17%, and the enrollment at, at University of Michigan is, is barely above 4%. Um, and, you know, it never got above around 8 or 9%, and then it, and then it dropped back down. Um, the, even the number of low income whites uh, getting into uh, Michigan and enrolling is, is very, very, very small. Um, they are, their own figure is that 4% of the student body comes from, quote, low socioeconomic status, which their definition is you don't, let's see, I think it's one of your parents was not a college grad and your family income is 50,000 a year or less. The median income in Michigan is something like 48,000. <laughs> so you can actually be <laughs> above the median income and they're still including yeah. you in this category of low socioeconomic status, which is a tiny, tiny portion of the student body. So, you know, the faculty numbers are not much better. They're basically similar in terms of the number of um, Latino uh, or Latinx, sorry, Latinx, um, African American, Native American, Pacific Islander um, faculty. The Asian, as you know, and Asian American numbers uh, are higher. Um, but what we found there uh, was really interesting. Um, so, you know, they've been padding their number of Asians on campus by bringing a lot of international students. So there are actually more students at Michigan from China now than there are mm. total African-American students at the University of Michigan. Um, <laughs> really? More, more foreign, more Asians from, who are foreign students? No, more, more students, international students just from China than there are mm. total African-American or Latino students at Michigan. And there would be more if they could play basketball or football. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so, so there are, uh, higher numbers of Asians, uh, but there's a there's a uh, there's been a bias towards bringing in these international students because they pay extra tuition right to the university. Mm, right, they pay a higher rate, and bringing in uh, out of state students because they also pay a higher tuition. Um, so even there, you have these you know income disparities going on. The other thing we found is even though there are significant numbers in some cases of uh, Asian students or Asian faculty. Uh, the leadership positions on campus, and again, this is the university's own studies, um, show a significant underrepresentation of Asian Americans in, in, in key leadership positions. And so, you know, among all the tenured faculty at Michigan, if you're Asian American, you are far less likely to be asked to be a to hold a senior leadership position than any, than any other ethnic group. So, Scott, now playing devil's advocate here, I mean, there could be other reasons besides discrimination, can't there? Yeah, and and but you know the reality is their own studies show that part of the reason why <laughs> uh, you have this problem is again poor faculty of color retention rates related to a hostile climate, related to microaggressions, related to structural bias. So you know the university's. Uh, own scholars um, and, 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 and committees have reported these things. Now, now when, when you put this out in your writings and in your media appearances, you must have known that this wasn't going to make you the most popular guy on campus, right? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's interesting. You know, every campus has obviously contentious issues and, you know, sometimes people take sides. The interesting thing about Michigan that I found is when I, for instance, when I published this uh, um, piece in the Chronicle of Higher Education, you know, read by thousands of people, a lot of people contacted me from Michigan and said, I'm so glad you, you wrote that because I completely agree and I've been wanting people to talk more about this, but I'm afraid. Um, people are afraid of being reprimanded by their boss or you know, having a negative stigma placed on them. And you know, that's sadly one of the things that university has been really effective at doing by covering up uh, cases of discrimination or sexual assault in other instances by uh, retaliating against whistleblowers who speak out about these things. Um, and again, by just n generally not taking efforts to retain uh, faculty of color uh, who are seen as more activist oriented um, in their work. So why did you take it upon yourself to, to, to expose this? Was it mostly your... Well, I know you mentioned your activist side, but the scholarly side, what, what, was, what was the greatest uh, motivating factor? Yeah, there are several factors. One is that I had people coming directly to me saying either they or 
uh, their, the students they were mentoring were being, um, were being harassed or attacked uh, by you know, uh, faculty and administrators who had authority over them or power over them. Um, a number of people were denied tenure in unjust cases, um, cases in which, again, uh, faculty of color going up for tenure or applying for jobs had much, much superior qualifications to you know, whites who got positions. Um, and in fact, there really, it, it, what happened in our department, there was effectively you know, a reverse affirmative action so that white people could, could get positions teaching about race and ethnicity over more qualified people of color. It, it happened again and again in terms of um, admissions, in terms of faculty hiring, and in terms of promoting faculty um, for tenure uh, and leadership positions. Uh, so that was a first. You know, the people would come to me and, you know, I was always taught, look, you know, if you were fortunate enough to get uh, support from others in the past, and you need that or you would never have gotten this far, you have to pay that forward you know, to people coming, um, coming up after you. So that was one. Um, the second factor is uh, when you lose that many people in such a short period of time, it's just corrosive. I mean, a department can't function, right? If you have this revolving door, it's demoralizing. It puts all this extra work on you. Um, and the most important thing, what happened is it just destroyed intellectual community. So the one thing we're all supposed to agree on is we're here to produce ideas and have a rigorous intellectual debate. And once people started covering up these problems and you know taking steps to silence others and stigmatize others, that just precluded any possibility you know of of maintaining the high level of intellectual discourse that we had established and that every department obviously should maintain. So the collegiality was gone, and the, t the term blacklisted came up, or has come up in reports about your, your situation. Did you feel blacklisted? Yeah, I think definitely so. I mean, the, the department chair told me explicitly she would not consider me for really any kind of meaningful position within the department. Um, mm. She usurped my role as chair of a faculty search committee, uh, and once I was, you know, basically removed for authority, she ended up um, presiding over a process that led to her own former student being hired. <laughs> um, these kind of things were happening. Um, and, but yeah, but again, I would, and oh, I'm sorry, the other thing I have to add is um, the dean's office cooperated, really conspired, I would say, with the chair of my department to keep all of this negative information on me, which is entirely based on false allegations. In fact, the dean's office, the associate dean, admitted to me in front of the faculty ombuds, who's a sort of neutral observer who I asked to come, right? So in front of, uh, uh, in front of a eyewitness, admitted that he had maintained these negative um, files on me without mm. my knowledge, uh, without substantiating any of the allegations, and he was using that basically to form a negative impression and help others form a negative impression on me, against me. Um, and this all came after his boss had basically threatened me in a meeting for challenging patterns of discrimination and inequity within the college. So, so this is something that uh, when I talk about this case to colleagues or friends and about, oh, you know, these two professors in Michigan, I said, I said that, well, and this guy, uh, Professor Kroshig, he was, he was a tenured professor, and they, that's one of the first things they say, tenured professor, and he's under attack like this? I mean, I, I think a lot of people think that tenure is sort of like your, uh, your invisible shield, but was it, did it matter? It does matter um, in a lot of ways, yeah, and we, we should continue to uphold the value of tenure. You know, there are other people at Michigan that get tenure and they see it as like sort of membership in a club. Now you have to go along with all the with all the, you know, people that run the club. Um, of course, tenure is meant to preserve academic freedom um, and independence. Right? Um, and so what it means is usually, again, if they can get rid of you before you get tenure, They'll do that, and sometimes they just make up some reason um, why one person gets tenure with the same qualifications or even greater qualifications, uh, um, lesser qualifications than others with greater qualifications. In my case, I got tenure. Again, I published at the top of my field. I won awards that go to people at the top of my field, awards no one in the history of the University of Michigan has ever won before or since. Um, so, you know, it's a lot harder 
to get rid of someone once they have tenure and once they have that scholarly standing. And so what I found was when they couldn't make those traditional arguments that they use to reinforce institutional racism, you know, traditionally what they say is, well, this white person, you know, their book won more awards or was published on a more prestigious press. They couldn't say that because the whites in our department generally had lesser, yeah. uh, lesser accomplishments on their resumes. And so what they had to say was, who has the best um, character or who is most civil, right? These abstract things in which they relied on assessments of character that were done secretly outside of university procedures based, as I said, on these types of secret communications being shared from my department chair uh, to the dean's office. Um, and that, that's the really sad state we're in because people could not challenge my qualifications and because some of these scholars, um, because some of these leaders in the department could not formulate an intellectual argument <laughs> against the uh, people who had been leading ethnic studies, they simply resorted to basically these underhanded tactics. Yeah, so it went to the ad hominem right there uh, to force you out. Character assassination, huh? Yeah, and again, we, we, we went through the record and we saw things. For instance, you know, the, when the first wave of faculty of color were hired into that, into that unit in the um, 80s and 90s, the faculty had almost an emergency meeting where they said, what can we do to make sure the college does not force us to accept any additional minority positions? I mean, these were explicit discussions. It's in their own minutes. I mean, the... Um, uh, and, and some people, you know, for good measure said, well, I don't agree with that. You know, I think we should have more ethnic studies. But others said, well, you know, um, ethnic studies is not central to our core analysis of American studies. <laughs> Believe it or not, right? They, 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 again, it was a very common argument, you know, um, when I was in grad school that people would say that. Um, and right. it, it's, it's, it's all, all just basket the, weaving, right? It's all on the record saying, you know, people in ethnic studies are, are just ethnocentric pressure groups that uh, they don't have the same, uh, that their work could be academically unsound. Um, or again, as this one person, one person in a meeting sp literally said, we must take a very strong stand and tell the dean we will not accept additional minority positions saying that these quote-unquote minority positions would undermine our core purpose in studying America. <laughs> I just, you know, again, it's, it's there. Um, yeah. So it got to a point where you were trying to work within the system. They were punishing you. When did it get to the point of resignation, which is really what they wanted, what they were seeking, it sounds like, from the, from the beginning? Yeah, so, you know, again, we had a very, very vibrant ethnic studies faculty, particularly also um, Asian Pacific Iron American Studies faculty, really, I think, one of the top programs in the whole country. Um, and that lasted until about 2011, when we lost four faculty in one year. Um, and, you know, I advocated for retaining those faculty. The dean's office was very opposed. Um, the chair of our department spread, you know, basically spread the, the, to these faculty, gave them misinformation about what he was doing, you know, um, to try to support them or what he was not doing, it turns out, to support them. Um, after I lodged that, uh, you know, appeal, um, that's when I was, I was threatened um, by the dean. I was given an implicit threat by the dean to really stop making those types of arguments because I was, you know, exposing um, misconduct uh, on, on, on the part of the, the dean's office. Um, after that, um, I really started to, um, well, it wasn't just me, again. The department itself was coming under review because the, there was, the, the climate was, was really deteriorating as all these faculty were being chased away. Um, graduate students were really feeling unsupported, particularly um, students of color and students in ethnic studies. And so what happened was in 2012, um, there was a very negative review of the programs uh, of, the, of the climate for the graduate program uh, in American culture. Um, and the department leaders censored it. Um, I had to get it uh, basically through a FOIA request later on. And what the report actually says is, again, there's a deteriorating climate, particularly on issues of equity. Um, a lot of it's redacted, so we don't actually, you know, have really the full extent to, to how big the problems were documented. But again, Everyone in the department knew at that time that there were those serious problems. 
And the, the chair and the graduate director basically not only censored the document, they, they, because they censored it, they could actually say that the, the climate problem was actually being caused by the students of color who were complaining about the climate. Their fault, yeah. Um, so they turned it around. And then when I was asked by the mentors of these students to really speak out against this, this stigmatization um, of, of students of color, um, I, uh, I was basically targeted as, you know, now creating a negative climate. Um, because we were all supposed to just pretend like these problems would go away on their own or, you know, somehow the department leadership could fix it on their own when clearly they were doing very little. Uh, and in fact, they were doing worse. They were retaliating against the students and faculty um, who were raising just, you know, basic, uh, um, basic issues about we want to be able to study. <laughs> we want to be able uh, to not be harassed. We, know we want the leadership of this part not to abuse their power. It's basic things like that. We want to not have all our faculty advisors leave year after year. Um, and they were so worried about the negative publicity that could come from this report that they censored it. And then again, they, 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 they actually turned it around and said the climate problem is being caused by the people of color and the ethnic studies faculty. So what was the last straw for you that said, that's it, I, I can't go on, and that, that got you to, to tender your resignation? Because, and this is before the lawsuit, correct? Yeah, so this was, like I said, that was um, around 2012. That led to, you know, some more um, faculty losses uh, around that, that um, controversy. Um, again, it's always the faculty of color, the ethnic studies faculty who are most leaving. There are a lot of retirement parties that I went to for white faculty, but it, I've, there's never been a faculty of color retire from that department. <laughs> They've always left or been fired. No room at the club, right? <laughs> yeah. So, so what happened after that was, you know, in response to the people, the, the two, like I said, the, the white chair and the white graduate director, you know, again, they're in those positions to basically manage diversity for the university, you know, to prevent the people that are the actual experts in ethnic studies running the department. They want people there who basically keep a lid on the ethnic studies um, faculty so they're not too critical thinking or acting. Um, and when they saw that, you know, clearly they were failing at that job, they uh, started to, again, um, really allow or push uh, my faculty of color colleagues to leave and ethnic studies colleagues to leave. And that's when they really started to escalate this character assassination campaign against me through these secret transmissions and communications to the dean's office. That led to uh, my being terminated as director of Asian Pacific Island American Studies in 2013. I had a multi-year contract. Um, I was highly successful in that position. Our enrollments were up. The number of students declaring our minor were up. Uh, the number of people event, attending our events, donating, uh, or my ability to raise money uh, from grants and other sources was these were all way up. Um, and you know, basically, one day I was just told, "You're not going to be director anymore." There was no hearing. There were no charges, or at least any that I saw in writing, uh, or was told. Um, there were just these secret transmissions full of false allegations sent from the chair or worked out between the chair and the dean's office together. Um, and not only did they do that, the director of API studies and the other ethnic studies programs was a college level appointment. So these were appointed by the dean. And so presumably you should not be um, removed from that position unless there's some kind of hearing and procedure that goes through not just the department, the dean's office. They secretly at some point, they've never even admitted they did this, um, against our own bylaws and against our own established practice, changed that position, demoted it from a college level to a department level position. So one day, that's why one day the chair could just tell me, hey, I have the authority to just kick you out of here <laughs> and remove you. Um, and it was just astounding. I mean, that people would stoop to that level of, you know, of authoritarian yeah. behavior. I, I had to consult, you know, I, I remember, I remember <laughs> telling people this, I had to consult with my uh, colleagues who are literary scholars and ask them, you know, what is the distinction between Kafka-esque and Orwellian behavior and practices? It turns out that they were doing a mix of actually the worst of both. Um, so, you know, after I was fired, I thought, okay, well, there must be some procedure. I can go, I'll talk to the dean, I'll talk to the provost's office, 
you know, again, I talked to the, the, the vice provost for equity, right? <laughs> His job is to focus on faculty retention. Um, literally, nobody did any substantive investigation ever. In fact, that vice provost for equity and inclusion, he never even answered me after he agreed he would investigate. Literally never emailed me back. I had to send him three, three emails and he wouldn't even answer the emails. So, you know, th this is astounding to me. I mean, I would, I would think this could happen in the corporate world, the freewheeling corporate world, but in academia where it is seen as a kind of ideal situation, especially a public, a public institution, Michigan denies, you know, any culpability in this. Yeah, I mean, they've, they, they've said they're going to vigorously defend. I guess the question is, what are they vigorously defending? I mean, because all of these actions are documented. So you're going you're gonna, to you, you're gonna defend, you know, the right of professors to, be, to win, a, to win a, a university award for graduate mentoring after they've received a record number of complaints by graduate students for <laughs> racial harassment, um, you know, homophobia, um, um, abuse of power. So, I mean, I guess part of the question, what are they defending, right? You've lost, students have lost the classes we've taught. They've lost the mentoring. The university acknowledges it doesn't have enough faculty who have this expertise, right? They have this whole diversity campaign and they're promising to get more people. So again, the question is, why don't you just stop chasing people away in the first place and then you won't have these crises? Um, but uh, I think the thing is, you know, you said this happens in the corporate world. Um, my, my advisor, um, who was a wonderful, wonderful scholar and sadly he passed away, um, told me as I was starting at Michigan, he said, you know, I think you'll, you'll be able to um, do a lot of great things there, um, but be warned that it's basically a company town. That the university and its administration really, you know, just in the way, you know, workers would be in a live in a town owned by a steel company and you know you lived in the housing owned by the steel company and you ate at the cafeteria owned by the steel company and the police local police were you know uh closely connected to the company in many ways that's the way uh, i think a lot of people feel they just feel that uh there's this bubble and the university leadership exercises so much uh, authority and there's just so much peer people start self-censoring when they're in this bubble I've had other people who left the university say I can't believe how much I, I st really just stopped being myself in order to conform to to the expectations of this university is this unique to Michigan or do you think this is something that happens in all these academic bubbles these uh, these islands where you know they create their own sense of justice I think uh, there's a certain trend, uh, pernicious trend throughout academia that's been well documented. But I think what's unique, it takes it. There's, it's at a new level at Michigan. One, um, because it's a, it's a very old school, you know, uh, and it basically dominates the whole town, um, and it is part of metropolitan Detroit. But it's done such a good job at walling itself off from Detroit. You know, there's a whole, as you know, long history of the suburbs of Detroit right. sort of walling themselves off from the city. And Michigan, you know, and Ann Arbor have done such a good job of sort of maintaining this bubble, even though, again, they're part of a metro. So, so for instance, you know, uh, if you go to most universities in a major metropolis, people live all over the city, right? It's only in Ann Arbor where literally almost every faculty member lives within walking distance of campus. So there's much more of this sort of uh, insider, you know, um, network old boys network um, feeling at Michigan. The other thing about Michigan has, because it's so old, has so many alumni, it has a very large endowment. Um, and it gets a lot of private donations. And so it's basically able to pay people salaries, uh, a, a, a strata of people salaries that keep them happy. So for instance, this vice provost for equity, he makes almost $400,000, maybe more when you count his perks. A year. That's more than a lot of university presidents make, right? Um, so, you know, people, once they have that level of wealth that puts them in the 1%, or people that aspire to that, or the positions just below that, which pay two hundred, three hundred thousand dollars $300,000 a year, um, those positions don't exist at a lot of schools. They certainly don't exist <laughs> at the current university I work for. Our, our chancellor doesn't make that much money, I'm pretty sure. Um, and so, you know, 
that level of money and peer pressure and the you know, so-called prestige that comes with being an elite university, uh, again, a lot of people resist it. They're the ones more likely to leave or be forced out. The people that are comfortable acquiescing to that are the ones that they take great, 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 um, go to great, great lengths to retain. Yeah, you weren't comfortable with that. You resigned and then a lawsuit. And you know, I really want to get to this question because there's lots of discrimination out there, not just in academia, but in corporate fields and real life. And some people don't think a lawsuit is always the best answer. In fact, yeah. I've talked to a number of attorneys at various junctures in my career, and a lawsuit was always like the last thing. And subsequently, I, I never sued. So I want to get in, into the sense of what made you think that the lawsuit was an answer? And what, what was your thinking to say, I've got to do this? Oh, I think you talk to just about anyone in academia and uh, a lawsuit is really the last resort. Um, I know in my case, um, a lot of people said, yeah, you should be afraid. I mean, a lot of people are afraid to take any kind of legal action because of the negative repercussions, either from your institution or just from academia in general. You could get, you know, labeled as, even if you are 100% in the right, you know, you're supposed to just sort of go along with your work and, 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 and not um, rock the boat. And of course, with Asian Americans, there's always that model minority sentiment that says, if you want to get ahead in, in any job you're in, right, you have to be just hardworking and studious and compliant, right? Um, and of course, you know, my work with Grace Lee Boggs, my own activism scholarship has been about pointing out how dangerous that model minority myth is, not just to Asian Americans, but to other people of color who, who, who get, you know, pitted against Asian Americans. So it was the absolute last resort. Um, I uh, tried every attempt possible to work within the system. Uh, and again, I was just stunned. I mean, I assumed that these lawyers and uh, administrators hiring within the system to look over equity would, would actually at least try to do their job. Maybe they wouldn't be as aggressive as I would hope they would be. But it turns out they did the exact opposite. We found out that the senior investigator who now works for their internal civil rights division, the Office of Institutional Equity, was hired after she was in a national scandal. She was at the center of a national scandal for doing phony investigations designed to protect the university from bad publicity or lawsuits. <laughs> they hired her to Michigan after she resigned in disgrace from the University of Vermont. The Attorney General of Vermont formally admonished her in an uh, independent investigation <laughs> or you know, uh, in a commissioned investigation at the university. Um, so that's the kind of things we discovered. Um, there are two other th factors. One is, um, I was being directly threatened by my department chair. Um, she was just making up false accusations against me. And then she started putting them in writing. So I actually finally started to see the kind of things she was uh, alleging. Um, she said, for instance, that I was a potential safety threat to students, which is, you know, again, I had won teaching awards. <laughs> I had written, uh, um, I'd been asked to speak about uh, my pedagogy as a model for other professors. I had won service awards. I had gotten recognized by community organizations, by our local U.S. congressman. Uh, industry. Yeah, but no black belt in anything? <laughs> no black belt um, <laughs> and no complaints. No complaints on record um, against me, you know, in my 14 years of teaching. And yet this based purely on stereotyping, you know, uh, and, and, and these malicious false rumors, the chair could simply just say, you know, you're a potential threat. And, you know... She actually sent me, um, she cited a university policy that says, if you are found to violate the civility code, you can actually be fired from a tenured position, which sounds like it comes out of the McCarthy era, but it's actually something they came up with quite recently and passed through the university to crack down on quote unquote incivility. And so again, if they can't, if they can't fault you, um, you know, uh, the old way they used to, which is excluding you from the publishing world or from, you know, the scholarly awards, we've, we've broken those barriers. Now they go after you on these grounds of incivility. This has happened to other professors. The other thing that happened was literally anything I tried to do constructively, when I tried to work with even the people I had disputes with, for the benefit of students, for the benefit of the department, they undermined everything. So, you know, we, I, I was chairing a search. We had 
nationally renowned scholars applying for a position, people who've won major awards in the field, and ev anyone I put forward <laughs> for potential consideration uh, to be hired was, was basically struck down simply because I was putting them forward. People I'd never met, you know, including people I'd never met and, and only had come through, through a, a, you know, a, a national search. But again, Scott, why it was it the lawsuit was there was no other way. There was just you saw that they failed you on diversity. They failed you in terms of reaching some kind of uh, collegial agreement or settlement, you know, in terms of what grievances you had. The lawsuit was the only way. Yeah, so it was very clear that my attempt to use the internal procedures uh, was going nowhere. In fact, again, they were manipulating those procedures to make sure that you know any complaint or report I had would be covered up. Um, the second thing is, um, like I said, um, oh, the, the the last thing with that was I requested a salary equity review, which is basically saying, you know, what are your accomplishments, and are we paying you consistent with what we're paying other people with your accomplishments? It's done in all kinds of jobs, right? Um, because again, I was at the very, very bottom of the pay scale, um, and people with you know, with no awards, <laughs> were were making a lot more than me. And people who had awards anywhere consistent with mine were making upwards of double what I was making. And I wanted to do that not because money is the most important thing in the world to me, but I just wanted to see how fair the system was. You know, I mean, obviously I wanted to be paid paid fairly, but I just wanted to test how fair the system was. So I was curious to see what rationale they would give, right? Once they did this, you know so-called objective review. It turns out, um, not only did they deny me the review, the dean actually said, oh, we don't have a review process. <laughs> <laughs> so a review process that I had confirmed from you know, other members of the dean's office they'd been using for years suddenly didn't exist when I requested it. I mean, again, that, again, made me question, is this more Kafka-esque or Orwellian, <laughs> what they're doing? Well, at this point, you must seem fairly confident going into the lawsuit. Well, again, I think, you know, um, there are a lot of documented facts, right? Um, we want them reviewed objectively. Obviously, you know, if you go forward, there's an opportunity to discover more things because, again, the, the things I have right now are only things that are either disclosed uh, in, you know, communications directly to me, in the public archives of the university, or things that they have allowed me to see, you know, under, under, you know, much, much protest. I mean, they've withheld so many things. We don't know all the things they were saying behind closed doors about me, you know, or about others. Um, and so, you know, that's another reason why even just to get the truth requires, um, requires basically, you know, challenging them with a legal complaint. The other thing I think that's important is this isn't just about me as an individual. You know, I could have done a lot of things in my career if I just wanted to live a more comfortable life um, as an individual. Um, I got into education because I believe education is a really critical, critical um, um, element of achieving, achieving equity in society um, and that education should be democratic. It should serve the public, particularly when you're at obviously a public university. Um, and so really this is an opportunity to say, how to, to, to sort of lift the curtain on how these universities do function and really lay out how they should function. So the, the best outcome is that this becomes maybe not just a landmark case for, for Michigan where it has its own civil rights law, but it could influence other states, other academic communities throughout the nation. Yeah, I mean, we certainly hope, again, you know, people can read the complaint, they can look at the sources, they can judge for themselves. But I can also say the university has the capacity right now to fix a lot of these things without being ordered to do so by the court. You know, Instead of wasting all these resources fighting us, why don't they just put those resources into solving some of these problems that clearly you know, uh, we've documented? Well, considering maybe the best outcome uh, for you might be that they, they do that and maybe hire you back. Would, would you want to go back to the University of Michigan? You know, we've said repeatedly, um, we went to uh, the University of Michigan because, again, um, we were committed to uh, building Asian American and ethnic studies in a place where it had really just been wiped out um, because of failed faculty retention prior to us. Uh, we were committed in making 
the flagship university of the state of Michigan more responsive to issues of equity and social justice, particularly when you have, again, such a large uh, metropolitan area with high concentrations of poverty, uh, with issues of police brutality, with issues of racial segregation. Um, and, you know, we felt like we were able to uh, accomplish a number of things uh, and the things we built up were undercut. So, yeah, for all those reasons, I think it's not just, you know, a legal responsibility. They should want, the university should want and should celebrate people that do these things. And they should, they should be less worried about, um, you know, they should be less worried about their rhetoric and more worried about the substance because, you know, people, people, I think, people will recognize substance when they see it. The university spends way too much money on these PR campaigns rather than just getting at the substance of the matter. Scott Kurashigi, formerly the director of Asian Pacific Islander American Studies at the University of Michigan, now suing the school with his wife, Emily Lawson. For Lawson, a Filipino-American, the story begins when she got a layoff notice after a pregnancy with a Down syndrome child who needed open-heart surgery. The baby, she is alive and well. Um, a lot of this happened while I was pregnant with her, and even more happened when she was having open-heart surgery. Um, and I was trying to care for her in her recovery. Um, you know, and you asked Scott earlier the question, why are we filing this lawsuit? Why are we fight? Why did we decide to fight? And I thought that myself as a lecturer without tenure, I'm, I'm a lecturer four, which is a senior lecturer. Um, so that's full time with a contract. And if these acts of discrimination could happen to Scott, who was a full professor with tenure, with the most major awards anyone could receive in our field, and then that could happen to me as a senior lecturer, what would happen to those even below us or who came after us? You know, and that's really why we chose to fight. And right. The, the lowly adjuncts like uh, I was at one point in my life. I mean, Exactly. And, you know, we love the Asian Pacific Islander American Studies students. They really were the ones that helped build that program from the ground up or rebuild it, I should say. And the alumni uh, are incredible, doing incredible things in the world now. And that's the greatest compliment any professor could have, is what your alumni are doing from what they've learned in our classes. And we wanted to see that continue. And we hope the university will allow that to continue. Now, you took actually took a leave. Uh, you were on maternity leave. You had a sense that something was up, but you took maternity leave. And they actually tried to, after you had the baby, they actually, the, the university actually tried to lay you off when you're trying to return. Is that it? Yes. Yes. When that happened, that must have stunned you. Oh, yes. <laughs> I was quite shocked. Uh, they actually did it on the day of the deadline to notify lecturers of reappointment. They had the secretary send me a letter at 10 o'clock at night. But, you know, my union representative stepped in immediately, immediately after I told them what had happened and got my classes reinstated. So I'm very thankful to my union representatives. Mm -hmm. Now, were they, was it a matter of, did you see it as a retaliation for your outspokenness in the same way that Scott had, you know, done some research about uh, the university and made some statements about the university's uh, how, how it deals with diversity and admissions. What were you saying that may have been uh, misconstrued or may have uh, been 
taken wrongly by the uh, by the university, and and so that they would come out after you. Yes, I I saw it as retaliation, most definitely, for mm. you know speaking up against the cover ups, right? The cover up mm. of these reports of discrimination, uh, for speaking out for you know faculty we had lost, uh, and for speaking up for ethnic studies in general. So, yeah, I definitely saw it as a retaliation. And um, my union saw it as that, too. I'm one of the last lecturers left. Right? So it's all a part of this um, being stigmatized, right? right. Um, I was also cast out as a quote-unquote spousal hire. Right, mm -hmm. uh, and that, to me, right, was pretty much an insult to the work. Right, the mm -hmm. you know, fifteen years of work that I did, uh, I continue to do. Right, to help build the programs there. You know, through this all, what were the the costs to, you know, your your personal sanity, your your family relations, your, you know, it wasn't just all happening at the at the uh, the halls of academia. It must have affected you outside too. Uh, yes, you know it, and I think that that is that is that may be part of their pretext. Right it is to wear you down, especially as a woman of color, right? And as a, as a Filipina woman of color, you know, as a Filipina American, right? My parents didn't get to graduate from college. They didn't even get. To, my mother never even went to college because of the war, right? And I think a lot of it goes back to relying on the stereotypes of Asian American women who won't speak out, right? Who won't fight back because we're supposed to be model minorities, right? And the cost there, as you say, right, to family and sanity, right, is how much shame can you endure, right? How much shame can you bring to our name? Right, we're not bringing the shame to the program. <laughs> uh, we're building it up, right? And so, you know, that was part of the struggle, right? Is realizing that we're not going to have that divide. You know what we, or not divide, but to diminish the work that we actually have accomplished. Now. I talked to, to Scott earlier, and we were talking about ways in which to mitigate, you know, the the possibility of a suit. Maybe to, you know, to talk about some of these things. Did do you feel like you exhausted all those avenues to to work within the university system, or do you think that you saw that that system was a sham? Well, you know, I had been working on mediation. I had asked the department um, to reconsider a number of the negative effects they were making um, decisions about that were affecting our program. And I was told that I had no say in the matter because I was just a spouse. Um, and we all, I actually asked for mediation. I, you know, I actually tried to do a number of different, um, tried to go through a number of different avenues. And the last straw was this last semester um, when I was denied to return to work, to teach. So, you know, we wanted to do uh, mediation, 
and it was not done. You know, one thing about a lawsuit is, and and one of the reasons why I wanted to talk to to both of you about this is because Asian Americans, Filipino Americans, we see discrimination at, at every level in our corporate lives, in our personal lives. And very rarely, though, do we get to that point where the lawsuit is the next step. And for some people, it's because that opportunity is taken away because of uh, it's built into the contract. You got to go through mediation. You know, the right to sue is taken away. Not so with you guys. And you are are going with the lawsuit. But it comes with some risks. I mean, do you fear some of those risks, like never being able to work again or not even being given the chance to go back to Michigan, like is, you know, like what you're seeking? I mean, is that... I mean, have you? Con- I'm sure you've considered those risks, but most people would run away from a suit if because the the risk would be too high. All of those things went through my mind, um, and being the mother of two small children, even ran through my mind, right? And but then again, I kept thinking, "Wow, if they could do that to me." <laughs> um, while they knew I was pregnant with a high-risk pregnancy, while they knew my baby had an open-heart surgery, and even though I had done all this work for the, for the program and won all of these awards, what could they do to others below me? What could they do to others that came after me? And so at some point, we have to get over those fears, right? Because... That's why we went into ethnic studies, right? To give voice to our people who don't necessarily have the privileges that we do to teach and to write and to speak up for our communities. And so to the people who are are listening, who are Asian Americans and they find that they're facing some of the things that you've described and some of the things that Scott has described, how do you tell them to, or what, what do you prescribe in terms of addressing those fears and going to, to get them to go forward or to get them to what? Well, we've been blessed to be surrounded by a community of scholars, activists, and community folks, families, and friends who have supported us through our many years of activism and Asian American studies. And I would I would advise folks to find those to find those folks who believe in you and believe in the truth to help you get through. We have a saying in I think you might know it. We have a saying in Filipino in Filipino American um, activism in the movement comes out of the movement called makibaka, means fight the struggle. And the response is usually wagmatakot, do not be afraid, have no fear. And my mentors taught me that. And that's kind of our message now too, to ourselves and to others who come after us. That's Emily Lawson, who with her husband, Scott Kurashigi, has filed a discrimination lawsuit against the University of Michigan. And now what about you? Are you going through something similar in your workplace, academic or otherwise? As Emily Lawson says, makibaka, fight the struggle. That's what it takes to get real justice. But as we know, it's getting harder and harder all the time. And that's our program. We're on iTunes. Please subscribe, rate, and review. You can contact me on Twitter at Emil Amuck or go to the ALDEF blog at www.aldef, that's A-A-L-D-E-F dot org slash blog. And give us your feedback. Thanks for listening to Emil Amuck's Takeout. I'm Emil Guillermo. <laughs>